Cataphract, Reconquest of the Roman Empire. Um, thought I would do a video on Great Battles of History. Uh, one, because I love the system, but two, Cataphract was probably my most wanted GMT reprint game for the longest time, since I started wargaming, since I learned how to play GBOH. Um, so this is reprinted in 2019 after originally coming out in 1999, so 20 years between first and second edition which is pretty incredible. I don't know if there's been another game that's had that long. If you know of one, let me know. So designed by uh, Richard Berg and Mark Herman, this sort of uh, chronicles, uh, well, th th the second edition, I believe, comes with the Attila uh, scenarios, Udis River and Catalonian Fields, um, which are sort of uh, final decades of the Western Roman Empire fighting against the Huns, but then it also comes with a bunch of uh, battles from the 6th century Eastern Rome, uh, mostly, well, all actually, uh, from the era of Justin, Emperor Justinian and his uh, the Persian Wars and the reconquest of the West, as it says on the title. Um, so I thought, you know, we'd look at a scenario. Uh, I decided to bust out uh, Casillinum from 554, which, um, w one, because it's just inherently ridiculous, um, so it's, it's, um, so it's, uh, the Byzantines, Eastern Romans, which are the purple there at the top, uh, against the Franks, sort of north of Naples in that sort of South Central Italy region, <clears throat> and kind of the historical background of this time period. So, uh, this is sort of the end, um, of the reconquest of Italy period. Which, by the way, is one of my favorite uh, periods in history, like top three by far. Um, and I can go into that in maybe another video. But uh, certainly the, the reign of Justinian, I mean, even going back as far as the reign of his uncle, Justin, Emperor Justin, um, they that whole period of Eastern Roman history is so fascinating to me and so full of incredible drama, s characters, uh, crazy events happening. So any game that I can get my hands on that kind of covers that period is, uh, like, thumbs up to me. So that's part of the reason why I was really uh, wanting to get Cataphract, to take sort of a tactical look at um, at the era, um, knowing so much about it, reading so much about it. Um, and Cataphract itself also actually also comes with a game, a strategic level game, of the entire Mediterranean called Justinian. And, in, and it's sort of a strategic look at the reconquest of, of the Mediterranean uh, region, specifically in the West, uh, by the Byzantines and and fighting off the Persians and the other um, barbarian peoples um, who are trying to stop them. Uh, so anyways, this scenario takes place sort of at the tail end of that period. Um, we're talking about, you know, essentially, this has been uh, 20 years of consistent warfare in Italy proper. I mean, it's reduced the population by a ton. This is sort of, you know, when you think of the Dark Ages and the and the uh, falling apart of the city of Rome when there's like 30,000 people left in the city. This is kind of the period we're talking about, but really the entire country. Um, the, the Eastern Romans essentially wrecked it over the course of two decades. Uh, first when they invaded in the 530s, <clears throat> fighting through the 540s, the kicking out the Ostrogoths, uh, the Burgundians raided the north during that time. Um, and it was just constant back and forth warfare. Um, after Belisarius was recalled to Rome to fight the Persians, uh, Justinian sent his uh, his eunuch advisor, essentially his his right hand uh, palace official, Narses, who's actually in the game. There he is. There, who was actually a very capable commander uh, on his own, um, back to Italy with uh, more troops um, from a severely depleted population to try and um, take control of Italy. Because what was happening as soon as the Byzantines would leave the, you know, leave a majority of the forces or have the majority of the forces withdraw to go fight other wars against Persia, Spain, other places, North Africa. Um, <clears throat> the barbarian tribes in the region would uh, basically take it as a, as a land grab, as a free for all. And so at this time in 554, um, you're talking about um, a large Frankish army who had sort of come down um, over the Alps um, into the northern plains uh, of Italy around, um, I guess what is today, Milan and uh, those areas. Um, and so essentially Narses, uh, was, you know, put an army together, confronted the Franks here um, near Naples, 
and essentially dealt a crushing blow. So uh, if you've never played Great Battles of History before, I'm gonna do my best to uh, like explain some of the mechanics and, and why the system is so cool. Um, but also I'll play through the scenario and see what happens. But essentially sort of the recipe for this one and the reason I chose it is because it is clearly unbalanced, uh, first of all, and it says so in the scenario setup. But essentially the Franks have set up in this wedge formation here, uh, like the tip of a spear. And, uh, you know, who knows how effective that was against their normal enemies, but certainly against, um, you know, a line of tra trained veteran Byzantine units, uh, it's probably not going to go well. But essentially the way the scenario is kind of scripted is that this wedge is going to charge, drive up the center, um, and it's going to kind of spread out and impact against the, the Byzantine line. And, um, you know, try and keep the momentum going to break the Byzantines before they're able to counterattack. So... Uh, that's, it should be interesting to play. There's a lot of, there's some special rules around how they do that, that kind of um, contra, go contra the normal Great Battles of History kind of strategies and processes. Um, and it shouldn't take too long because it's a pretty small scenario. Uh, so, so yeah, so I just want to give you a look at it. Um, I will uh, do a closer look at the armies and kind of what they're made up of and kind of explain uh, the units. Um, if you're not familiar, I'll do that quickly. And then, uh, and then we'll get into gameplay. Okay, so here's the the Frankish wedge formation that they're going to start the battle with. Now, you've got a couple different kinds of units here. So, first of all, the front of the wedge, there are three berserker medium infantry units <coughs> who are going to probably hop up on drugs and uh, are going to uh, basically sprint in, into the uh, line of Byzantines across this plain. Uh, and then behind them, we've got some regular Frankish medium infantry all the way through here, two leaders, uh, Buckelin here and uh, a leader here who, um, we don't know his name. Uh, in fact, we he's kind of an invention for the scenario. They needed another leader, uh, but uh, his name is not historically accurate. <clears throat> so um, if you've never played Great Battles of History before, this is a tactical um, series mostly uh, centered around ancient warfare, um, but there's games from all sort of eras. Um, if you're into Roman tactical and you want something deeper than like a Commands and Colors Ancients, uh, Great Battles of History, to my mind, is probably the, the best sort of simulation of what that kind of warfare could have possibly looked like. Um, so plenty of uh, games, uh, Roman games, there's SPQR, which came out with the Deluxe Edition, which just has like a ridiculous number of scenarios in it. <clears throat> and there's a, on um, GMT's website right now, there's a P500 listing for um, an updated version of Caesar, Conquest of Gaul, um, that is going to incorporate a lot of the um, sort of Roman Republic um, stuff around the time of Caesar. So that should be really cool and really interesting. Um, but there's also games that cover other things. I think Devil's Horseman covered the Mongol invasions, uh, sort of in the medieval era, um, there's been a Bronze Age game, Chariots of Fire, which I own. Um, there's even, I think, uh, one of the first Great Battles of History games was Lion of the North, which is actually a 30 Years War period, I believe. Um, but primarily they're ancients uh, focused. Great Battles of Alexander is um, Macedonian Greek. Um, so anyways, um, getting back to this game. So what makes what kind of sets Cataphract apart from some of the other games is that it's very cavalry heavy. Um, the Byzantines... The Eastern Romans, however, whatever you want to call them, were obviously a very um, cavalry-oriented military structure. Uh, cavalry, and specifically cavalry who were heavily armored, and cavalry that could that were equipped with bows that uh, did a lot of ranged firing. And they picked up a lot of this through their war with the Persians and other steppe tribes uh, who they bordered. Um, and so the the it's it's actually quite interesting to see sort of the evolution of the Roman. Uh, military from the imperial era into the Eastern Roman Byzantine era and how sort of their neighbors uh, influence their um, technology for warfare. So um, <clears throat> coming back to the actual game system, um, I just want to give a quick overview of, um, you know, what these counters look like and what they mean. So if we take a look at this Frankish middle infantry here, there's a couple values. This one in the lower right, it's its movement value. This one here, this in the gray box, it's five. That is its tactical quality. That basically represents its, um, it represents a lot of things, but essentially think of it like its hit points. So every time a unit takes a hit and you can take it for a number of things, not just being attacked in this system, um, you're always gonna uh, check against its, its quality. And if it ever takes five hits, in this case, because it has a five, it's gonna route, which means it's gonna run off the map. 
but you do a lot of rolling against that to see if you take hits in a charge um, and in shot combat and stuff like that. So probably the most important value in the system. You can see this five here in the red, that's the size of the unit. And basically that just determines um, it went in combat, went in shot combat, you know, if someone's bigger or smaller, there are um, advantages and disadvantages respectively. And then up here, you can see in the circle, that is a very tiny F. Um, that just means that these Franks are um, equipped with Frankish axes. And so anytime you see a letter in a red circle like that, that's their ranged uh, weapon that they've got. So, um, <clears throat> like I said, they have Frankish axes. They're going to be, as they as they charge, they're going to be uh, throwing those at close range against the Byzantines. And then uh, finally here, we'll take a look at this leader. Um, so this leader has a bunch of different values. Uh, in the lower um, right, I believe that is his charisma value. So that's going to provide a bonus to um, combat um, for units with him. You've got his uh, personal combat value, which uh, is going to determine whether or not he lives or dies or is wounded if he takes a hit, um, if I'm not mistaken. This number here, this five, that's his command range, so he can command units within five hexes of himself. The three is his initiative number, so in this game, uh, which leader gets to activate, uh, it goes basically low to high with initiative. So for example, with a three, he's going to activate before this guy, but of course the, the Byzantines have their own leaders, and so you always just go low to high, and that kind of determines the order of, of how turns go. Um, and those can be interrupted with die rolls and so forth. And then this uh, one number on each of these leaders is the number of line commands that they can issue. Now, a line command is a command to a bunch of units that are all kind of standing in a line that are the same as defined by the scenario rules. In this scenario, um, every single uh, medium infantry um, is considered a uh, part of a line. So um, if they issue a line command, he could move uh, the line of, of adjacent middle inf uh, medium infantry here forward. <clears throat> so that's kind of the gist of the stats that you're looking at. Um, a f and, and I'll just add on to that and say that a five tactical quality is uh, probably above average, I would say. So um, they're not going to break immediately, but certainly they don't. They can't take a lot of hits in battle before they're going to break. Um, I will flip this around and we'll look at the Byzantine forces and their lineup, uh, and then we'll get into the first turn. Um, so here is kind of the, the right side of the right flank of the Byzantine line. Um, you can see that we've got, uh, so we've got, it kind of, they're, they're mixed together, a lot of these units, but you can see we've got some Byzantine heavy cavalry. You can see that their uh, tactical quality is an eight. Um, and specifically, these are Buccalarian heavy cavalry. So these are like the actual titular cataphracted heavy cavalry. Um, the Buccalarian um, heavy cavalry, those were uh, sort of the elite of the elite for the Byzantine um uh, mounted military, um, and they, um, in when Belisarius uh, was the sort of prime general of the Byzantine army, they were actually personally trained by him. But you can see that they're actually um, equipped with composite bows as well, um, which are very powerful at close range. So they can do, um, they're very mobile, eight movement, they can do ranged attacks, and they've got a great tactical quality, so they're going to stand and fight for quite a while. They are small, um, these Buccalarians. Um, so, you know, likely in this scenario, they're going to sort of charge out of these woods uh, after the wedge crashes into the line and uh, do just devastating hits to the Frankish uh, flanks. <clears throat> um, you can see also that uh, there are some, so we've got some uh, more cataphracted heavy cavalry. These are from Thrace, um, which would be the Balkans region of the Byzantine Empire. Um, not quite as good, but they're bigger. They also have compound bows. And then intermixed with them, we've got some auxiliary, um, auxiliary light infantry, also equipped with bows. These are sort of archers. They're going to be able to fire as stuff gets closer. I pointed out Narses earlier. He's the overall commander for the Byzantine force. Um, I'm sorry they're upside down. I'm going to use them to, um, so I can see who they are and where they are. I'm going to uh, keep them that way so I can see what their values are. But the reason that the units are faced a certain way is that in the system, facing matters. And so you always face the vertex of a hex. So uh, you can change facing while you're moving, and that's the reason for that. Uh, moving over to the main line here, you got, uh, actually the Byzantines have a bunch of leaders, but uh, you can see that sort of the main line of infantry here, um, there's some light infantry, uh, some heavy infantry, um, the, the heavy infantry and uh, don't actually, aren't equipped with any ranged attacks. And then uh, as we keep moving down the line, uh, we've got some more medium infantry. Those are Haruli, so those are barbarian allies uh, to the Byzantines. Some more auxiliary archers, um, all kind of mixed in. Some Armenian cavalry on this wing over here. 
Uh, also heavy uh, cataphracted cavalry. And then interestingly, in this scenario, which I've never seen this before uh, in GBOH, is these two units here. This one, they're each stacked with a leader. This one is Haruli Lancer Cavalry, so um, pretty swift. And actually, yeah, they're also kind of elite Haruli Cavalry. The Haruli were known for their horsemanship. Um... And we're frequent allies of the Byzantines during this period. This one here is a... What is that? Looks like Hunnic cavalry. Yeah, looks like some, some Hunnic cavalry that the Byzantines are paying to help them fight light cavalry. They've also got compound bows. Um, and they're actually going to be able to do what's called harassment and dispersal. So light cavalry armed with bows can actually run up, shoot some arrows, and run away real quick before um, other units can, can do anything about it. So it's looking like this flank as well uh, will, uh, essentially, <laughs> the Byzantines, um, they're going to wait for, for this wedge to come in here to crash. You know, they might lose some of this interior, but these sides are absolutely going to envelop uh, what happens to the Franks as soon as they get close. And that's historically how this, uh, this played out. Um, Narses handed the Franks their ass and, in fact, defeated them so badly that they withdrew from Italy proper, um, like the entire country. And it gave sort of the Byzantines the final closing chapter of, of controlling Italy, uh, more or less, uh, you know, for the next 50 years or so before the Lombards came down. And, um, you know, that's a whole nother story. Um, so that's the scenario. Um, let's get playing it and see how this turns out. Should be uh, pretty hilarious to watch the uh, to watch the Franks crash into this line. All right. Turn one. Uh, Frankish wedge is underway. They are uh, heading <laughs> essentially into this part of the line up here where there's uh, sort of weaker infantry uh, for the Byzantines going to try and make a breakthrough there. This lead unit right here got just absolutely peppered with arrows. He's actually very close to breaking. He's got six hits on him, and he has, even though his tactical quality is a six, there's a special rule that says undisciplined armies have a bonus of two tactical quality until someone routes. So uh, he's very close to breaking. It just basically all these units in here were firing, firing away, um, pelting him with arrows. This Hunnic cavalry came out of the woods, uh, tried to do some hits onto the side here, but uh, failed. So they're just gonna probably they may do some harassment and dispersal this turn. Depends on how the wedge is going. This wedge, by the way, is now in an, um, what's called an uncontrolled advance. So they're all gonna move first at the beginning of the turn, and it uh, looks like they're gonna enter shock combat immediately. The Byzantine uh, heavy cavalry here kind of came out and swung this flank around. They're lining up for a charge, um, which they're going to get to do uh, very shortly, and that should be pretty disastrous. So uh, this will be over pretty quick, <laughs> but it should be pretty entertaining to watch it all fall apart. So that was pretty chaotic. Um, as you can see, <laughs> uh, a lot of fighting, a lot of fighting units uh, running the wrong direction. So the wedge has finished its sort of smash into the Byzantines. They actually, they cut pretty deep into this line. You can see a lot of these light infantry auxiliaries. Um, some of these are medium infantry. Um, they were put to uh, route in the center, um, primarily with the tip of the spear going through here. Um, however, <laughs> when it came time to sort of charge uh, or advance into um, missile range, um, a lot of these barbarian, these Frankish medium infantry, uh, buckled under the assault and so have turned around and are fleeing, uh, away from the battle. They were actually doing pretty well. Um, so every time one of these units routes, um, you check to see if their tactical quality, it goes back to what's printed on the counter rather than being too higher. And they actually lasted a pretty long time, uh, with their their bonus. Uh, I think it was like, it took four or five units routing before they failed that check. But as soon as they did, there were a bunch of units up in here sort of engaged in the melee that were at their uh, printed TQ who suddenly just turned around and ran, <laughs> I guess when they saw their friends go down. So uh, that's, I mean, they've got what, one, two, three, four, seven units who are still unrouted, uh, which is probably an untenable position for them. <clears throat> and uh, we haven't done even the rest of the activation on the second turn for leaders. We just did the wedge. So uh, it's going to be pretty nasty when this line of heavy cavalry right here uh, gets to go because they're just going to sweep in and just run rampant over these routing units and going to eliminate them. And uh, the route score right now um, is the, the Franks are at 15. 
um, 15 points of units that have been eliminated. Um, if they get to 40, the scenario is over. So really, we only the the Byzantines only really have to take out um, you know four or five more, depending on their TQ. So it's not looking great. Um, you know when when this leader gets to go, he may try and uh, rally some of these guys, but he I don't know that the I don't know that he's going to have a great chance to do that. Um, so yeah, so uh, <laughs> kind of an interesting, uh, fun little experiment here. Um, can't wait to can't wait to charge down the the fleeing units with the heavy cav. So let's get to that, and I will come back probably when the scenario is over, which will be very soon. All right. Well, as expected, the Franks have been defeated soundly, uh, driven off the field of battle by a charge from the flank heavy cavalry who came in and obviously every unit that was in here is dead now. And that basically was enough. Uh, there was a couple of missile engagements over here that knocked out some units. Um, there's a couple of Byzantine units up here that this Frankish infantry managed to charge off. Um, and then this unit with this leader under it managed to make a, um, a rally. So it was going to be back in the fight. It was a berserker, but ultimately too little too late. And the Byzantines prevailed with their elite cavalry units, as you would expect. Let this be a lesson to you. Don't form up in a wedge against a mounted cavalry-based army and leave your flanks exposed. Uh, because we could all see what was going to happen from the beginning, and uh, history in this case was preserved. I'll show you the dead piles, just to see how lopsided it really was. Uh, got a couple auxiliary light infantries who were killed, a Lombard heavy infantry, uh, which is probably the most impressive feat that the Franks pulled off this game. And then down here, obviously all of these guys were routed and destroyed um, on the Frankish side. So <clears throat> not even really particularly close. And obviously I wouldn't recommend this scenario being a two-player scenario if you're playing with a friend. Uh, Cataphract is nice in that it has a lot of balanced two-player scenarios. So if you do end up getting the game or playing the game, uh, definitely pick one of those. Um, because it's a great game. It's really fun, especially if you like cavalry. Um, it's all about cavalry in this period. And um, in general, Great Battles of History is a, is a fantastic system um, for Ancients Tactical. And once you get a hold, once you grapple and come to terms with the, sort of the command rules um, and when you're supposed to roll dice, what things cause a die roll, um, you can play it really quick. I finished this scenario in, you know, it says two hours face to face, but I finished this probably in pff, maybe an hour and 10 minutes of actual playtime. So um, very manageable. Um, I'm going to do some more Great Battles of History uh, content on the channel, and I will probably crack open SPQR at some point, uh, because I have yet to play it, and this is as good a time as any to get some of those scenarios going, and I know everyone loves Romans, um, and I will probably do a couple more scenarios uh, from Cataphract as well. Uh, maybe some of the Attila, so Romans versus Huns in the, uh, in the mid-5th century, those might be fun. Anyways, if you have any requests about, uh, you know, Great Battles of History scenarios you want to see or particular games, um, I do own SPQR Deluxe, I do own Devil's Horseman, and I do own Chariots of Fire. So happy to demo those as well. Feel free to leave a comment. And I will see you in the next uh, video, which uh, will probably be another World War II themed game. Um, and I'm excited for that one.